Have you been told what's really going on in the creation story in the Bible? Because the truth is, creation isn't really preached often in most churches. Sure, kids are given a quick summary in a children's program, and it might appear in a sermon arguing against evolution. But the truth is, most churches don't dive deep into the story of creation and explain what's really going on, including some things that might surprise or even disturb you. So if you want to know what they are, and if you want to learn what's really going on in the story of creation, then join me for this episode of Misreading Scripture. Now before we start, if you're interested in learning more insights that will help you to understand the Bible more clearly and see it with an entirely new set of eyes, then make sure to click the link above and down in the description where you can download a free book I wrote called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. It's a quick but powerful read that will teach you a whole lot in just a short period of time, just like this video. Speaking of, let's dive in. The first thing that most people don't know about the creation story is that it's written from a very different mindset and with a greatly different perspective than most of us have today. See, the truth is, the people who recorded the account of creation saw the world very differently than most of us do. They viewed it with the mindset of people living in the Near East thousands of years ago, people who had never seen pictures of space or traveled across an ocean or ever even heard of science. And because of that, they understood the world in a way that feels primitive to most of us. For instance, on day two, Genesis recounts how God said, let there be a vaulted dome in the midst of the waters and let it cause a separation between the waters. So God made the vaulted dome and he caused a separation between the waters which were under the vaulted dome and between the waters which were over the vaulted dome. And it was so. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably found this confusing when you read it as a child or even as an adult. I mean, what in the world is this vaulted dome or firmament as some Bibles translate it? But if you were living several thousand years ago in the Near East, this would have made perfect sense. And that's because people in that region at that time believed that when they looked up and saw a blue sky, that blue sky was water being held back by a giant divider, a dome or firmament or whatever you want to call it. Sometimes the dome would open up and allow rain to fall to the earth. But either way, that blue was water on the other side. Similarly, they also believed that not only was there water above them on the earth, there was also water below it. Underneath the earth, there was water that was being held back in a similar fashion. This explains why when Noah faces the giant flood in Genesis 7, it says, all the springs of the great deep were split open and the windows of heaven were opened. In other words, it's saying the vaults above and below are opening up to allow the waters to come forth. But this isn't the only way that the biblical authors saw the world differently. For instance, on day one, God said, let there be light, and there was light. But here's the strange thing. Even though there is light upon the earth, God has yet to create the sun. That won't come until day four. And that's because in Near Eastern thought, the sun wasn't necessarily the earth's primary source of light. They believed that light also came from the moon and the stars. So it seems scientifically impossible for us or requires creative explanation made complete sense to them. And that actually leads us to the next important thing that most people don't know about the creation story, which is that the creation story in the Bible has a unique purpose. See, one of the things that I teach people who are trying to better understand the Bible is that one of the first things you have to do when studying a passage is to recognize and surrender your biases. I mean, we all approach scripture with our own perspectives and purposes, often without realizing it. For instance, when we hear Jesus talk about the importance of children, we immediately hear those words through the filter of whatever our culture values about children, whether that is their innocence or their simple faith or whatever else our culture might value. And without realizing it, we interpret the text through that lens. Well, in a similar way, the culture we live in causes us to approach the creation story with a purpose, right? Without necessarily realizing it, we expect the creation story to give us a scientific explanation for how the world was created. We expect it to answer our questions about nature and history and biology and the scientific beginnings of the cosmos. But what if that's not what the Bible's trying to do? What if that wasn't even on the minds of those who recorded the creation story? What if that's our purpose, not the Bible's purpose? You see, while we want Genesis to give us a scientific history of the origins of the universe, it's actually trying to do something else. It's trying to give us the spiritual history of the origins of our relationship with God. Rather than trying to explain physics and astronomy and biology, 
It's trying to reveal to us who God is through God's creation and what that shows us about our relationship with God. Creation explains how our relationship with God began, why God created the world, how the world became so corrupt, and how the relationship formed between humans and God at the very beginning shapes our relationship with God today. And this is where it's so important to remember that this creation account wasn't created in a vacuum. It wasn't recorded in isolation, wholly separate from the world at that time. It was very much written with the world in mind. In fact, that leads us to our next important insight that few people know about the creation story, which are the outside influences. When we look closely, we can see that there are many similarities between the biblical account of creation and other accounts at that time in that region. But this doesn't necessarily mean that the biblical authors were simply stealing from these other accounts to create their own. Quite the opposite, actually. The Bible is drawing upon these other accounts in order to tell a much different story. The God of the Israelites is a much different God than the gods of the nations that surround them. And the creation story intends to make that quite clear. For instance, on the fifth day, God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kind. You see, the word we translate sea creatures is the Hebrew word tanin, and it's a word that definitely would have caught the attention of early listeners. You see, tanin is a reference to creatures who served the god Yam in Canaanite mythology. Yam was depicted as a leviathan, a giant sea creature. So by saying that God created tanin, Israel is claiming the Lord's superiority over Canaanite gods. The Lord isn't simply like all the other gods. Yahweh is supreme, greater than all the gods. And unlike the other gods who cause chaos or ignore the suffering of those experiencing it, Yahweh orders chaos. And this leads to our final important insight into the creation story that most people don't know, which is that there is an intentional pattern to the creation story. Rather than simply being a list of events, the creation story has a pattern. For three days, God creates and divides. On day one, God creates light and separates light from darkness, forming the heavens. On day two, God separates the waters above from the waters below, forming the sky and the seas. On day three, God separated dry land from the seas. And then, for the next three days, God fills each of these. On day four, God fills the heavens with the sun, moon, and stars. On day five, God fills the sky with birds and the seas with fish and other creatures. And on day six, God fills the land with animals and humans. And then on the final day, God rests. And all of this is meant to tell them who their God is and to proclaim it to the world. You see, this is no typical God of that era in that region. This is not a God of chaos and violence. At that time, people believed the gods were responsible for practically everything that happened in their lives. Birth, death, storms, floods, famines, droughts. The gods were temperamental and unpredictable. People lived in fear of the chaos around them. And in this creation story, we see a bold declaration that this is not who God is. This is not a God who brings storms and floods upon the people. This is not a God who abuses humanity and delights in their suffering or shows little interest in their insignificance. This is a God who brings order and peace into the world in which they live. A God who cares for and provides for them. A God who reigns above all the other gods. And perhaps most surprising of all, a God who rests and will teach them to do the same. This is a God who in the chapters to come will see humans ruin the creation he so carefully ordered and who will show grace and forgiveness in that moment. Who will go on to give them even more guidance for how to live in this world that can still feel so dangerous and so chaotic. You see, this is a God who loves, who is involved. And all of this is still true. You see, while the creation story may not be trying to answer all of our scientific questions, it is giving us answers to much more important questions. It helps us to understand the world around us. It gives us hope and promise. And most importantly, it reveals to us a God who truly loves us who is just as interested and involved now as he was at the dawn of time. In a world still filled with so many little gods, not the foreign deities of biblical times, but very real idols like money and power and materialism. In a world where these gods still vie for our hearts and yet offer nothing but chaos, 
Genesis reminds us of who our God truly is, that we worship the God above all gods. And that, in the end, is the message that still remains the same. This is the God of our hope. This is the God of our salvation. And this is the God who deserves all of our praise. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Now, if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to click the link above or down in the description and download my free book called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, videos that will change the way you see familiar passages in the Bible, then just click this link over here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.